Well, good morning, baseball fans. I hope you are doing well, and I want to say a special welcome to those that are joining us online this morning. We're glad that you are a part of the worshiping community. I also want to extend a special welcome to those that are joining us on the radio this morning at KTCU. We are glad, too, that you have chosen to be with us wherever you are and hope that you immediately feel the sense of being a part of this worshiping community. So we are continuing this morning a series that we're calling Life Comes At You Fast, a a title I shared with you last week that I shamelessly and unapologetically stole from a nationwide insurance commercial. But as I was reminded a number of different times this week, that phrase, Life Comes At You Fast, is not original to nationwide insurance. It actually was first spoken by a wise prophet by the name of Ferris Bueller who said in perhaps one of the greatest movies of cinematography history, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, life moves pretty fast. And if you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. And we know that to be true. So we're looking at the four parts of life through the four parts of David's life, using that as a lens. Last week we talked about the childhood of delight. This morning we're going to look at adolescence, what I will refer to as the valley of transition. And the next week, we'll look at adulthood, and the following week, we'll look at older adulthood. Where we find the story this morning is in the 17th chapter of Samuel, which describes this climactic moment in the drama that is David's life. And he's in this in-between stage. He's no longer uh, playing in the sand pile with his toys. Now he's out tending sheep, but yet he's still... He's still under the control of adults, his father, his older siblings. Remember, he was the youngest of ten, but also the king, King Saul. Three of his siblings have been enlisted in Saul's army, and they were fighting at that time the Philistines, who were quite literally destroying the army of the Israelites. And one day, uh, David's father goes to David and says, I need you to take this food to your brothers. They're there on the front lines. I want you to go and take this food. And when you come back, bring me word on how they are doing. And so off he goes. And when he arrives at a place called the Valley of Elah, he describes that those in the entire army are shaking in fear. That there is this huge mountain of a man by the name of Goliath who would come out each morning and stand in front of the army of the Israelites and and challenge them and dare them to a duel. That's how he would begin each day, end each day, by challenging one-on-one combat. And he was so big, he was so bad, that the entire Hebrew army was paralyzed in fear. But David's reaction, of course, a typical teenager filled with adolescent idealism, steps forward, raises his hand, and says, I got this. And he accepts Goliath's challenge. Now, at first, King Saul says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're just a boy. This giant has been a soldier his whole life. But David was relentless and explained that while he was tending sheep, there were lions and tigers and bears that would come and try to steal, nice work by the way, just, just checking to make sure you guys are paying attention, this side was a little slow on the uptake back there, good job. So these lions and these tigers and bears would come and try to steal the sheep and he would fight them off with his bare hands, sometimes he would even kill them. So finally Saul says, okay, go on and may God go with you. That's where we pick up the story this morning. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. Thank you. 
I want you to know that she has read scripture at all three services this morning, so she gets an A+. It's hard, isn't it? You have to do it every day. Uh, There's a lot that goes on. So a scholar once said that in the ancient stories, we sometimes recognize our own story. That's what we're doing here, looking and recognizing our own story in the story of David. Now, as we think and consider adolescence this morning, I came to the realization this last week in preparing for this that I have now reached the phase in my life, even though I did youth ministry for about 15 years, that it has been a minute since I was dealing with this age as a youth pastor, but also I can barely remember high school myself. I've reached that age. But yet now... As the parent of four adolescents, I'm seeing this in a different way. Let me just pause for just a moment of personal privilege. Today is our youngest, Caroline's 16th birthday. So she's not here this morning. She's sleeping in like a typical teenager. But the next time I hope that you see her, that you will wish her a happy, sweet 16th birthday. And uh, I would encourage you, if you're going to be out on the streets, to make sure you look both ways. I'll just leave that right there. But in preparation this morning, I went and looked to see what other people had to say about adolescence, and I came up with a few uh, great quotes that I want to share with you this morning. The first one is this, the main problem with teenagers is that they're just like their parents were at that age. (laughs) Not going to offer any commentary at all, I'm just going to leave that right there. The second one is this, teenage is when your offspring quit asking where they came from and refuse to tell you where they're going. (laughs) This one's one of my favorites. Adolescence is a time of rapid change. Between the ages of 12 and 17, for example, a parent ages as much as 20 years. (laughs) And then from the words in the mind of Mark Twain, who said this, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant that I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished to know how much he had learned in the last seven years. (laughs) I have a friend who's a pastor who one time was dealing with a group of senior citizens, people in their 60s through their 90s, what was the most difficult time in your life? Now, keep in mind that these folks in the senior adult group had been through, some of them, the World War, the Great Depression, some of the great struggles in life. What was the most difficult time, he asked? 90%, he said. He said those teen years, adolescence, was the hardest time in life. One person described this segment of the human pilgrimage known as adolescence as a a time of indigestion, heartburn, and trauma. And it's hard to know sometimes on who it is most difficult, whether it's the adolescent going through these physical and emotional and social upheavals, or the parents and the family members who have to live with those teenagers going through this. Suffice it to say, it's a time that offers something painful for everybody. But let me be clear. That adolescence is not about body change. That's puberty. There are great physical changes that take place in that time, but that's not what we're talking about this morning. Adolescence is a psychological term that speaks of the movement between dependency, the dependency of childhood, and the independency of adulthood. Now, A number of years ago, when I was doing youth ministry, I came to the realization that many tribes, most cultures in the world today, have some sort of ritual, some sort of rite of passage to signal that progression from one age to the next. But that we, we don't have any type of rite of passage in that way. So when I was working on my doctorate, I, my doctoral presentation was about creating rights to help young people navigate through that transition. And one of the things that I discovered at that time in doing that work is that adolescence is lasting longer than it has in generations before us. 
And part of that is cultural. Uh, more and more people are going to college, getting married later in life. You still have 26-year-olds living at home, going to graduate school, being supported by parents. Part of that's cultural, but also part of it is biological. In that, kids are developing earlier. Because of technology, because of social media, they are being uh, subject to and experience things earlier than they have in years past. But not only that, what doctors and psychologists and neurologists have come to discover is that our brains are developing longer. It was used to believe that when you reached the age of 20, 21, that you were fully cooked and that your brain had stopped developing, but what they have come to discover is that some significant brain development takes place between 18 and 26. Well, let's look at the story this morning. Here's David. He's a teenager. He's been anointed for something big, but yet he doesn't know what that is. And he finds himself in the valley, both literally and figuratively. He's in the valley of Elah, facing Goliath, but also he's in the valley of transition. And what David discovers is that in the valley of transition, you confront giants that you know have the capacity and the capability to kill you. But isn't it true that anything we run from in our lives, we will run from forever? But anything we confront, we can deal with. As Mr. Rogers once says, what is mentionable is manageable. If we can confront these they will in time disappear. So here's David. and He's ready to confront his fears. He's ready to confront this giant that seeks to destroy him and his people. And they put, they put all this armor on him, this helmet, this sword. They give him all these things, and they, they dress him up in order to protect him, which I realize now is what we do to our young people, isn't it? We want to bubble wrap them to make sure that they stay safe physically but also emotionally. But yet he can't move, and I would argue that many young people say the same thing about all the restrictions, all the things that we place upon them, the rules, they feel suffocated, unable to move and to navigate. So he just strips it all off. He dumps the protection, and he, he goes there to the stream, and he, he picks up five smooth stones in order to slay the giant in his life. This morning, I want to name quickly five smooth stones that we might use to help us navigate through this valley of transition. The first is ambiguity. Adolescence. Adolescents want clarity. They want things to be black and white. They want to know what's going to happen next, and they want next to happen as quickly as possible. They want to know what's happening they want clarity. But adolescence, much like life, is learning to live with ambiguity. It's about becoming comfortable with uncertainty. And I would argue that if you don't learn to live with ambiguity in adolescence, you'll have a hard time learning that later in life. I mentioned a moment ago my doctoral work. Uh, one of the main parts of my research was with a, a gentleman by the name of Bill Bridges who wrote a book called Transition, and he discusses the difference between change, which is external. A change might be uh, getting a new job, uh, having a child, whatever that might be. That's the change that happens in our life, moving to a new place. But transition, though, is the internal. It's the emotional, it's the social, it's the intellectual change that happens that is internal. And Bridges says that the difference is that change starts with a new beginning, but a transition begins with an ending. He goes on to also say that all of life, all of grief in life comes when something ends before you are ready for it to end. It's another sermon for another time. But he says transition, though, happens in three stages. And the first is there's an ending. Whatever that ending is, whether you were ready for it or not, it starts with an ending. And then you enter into this stage of liminality, kind of a, a, a neutral zone, a time of transition. 
It's only at the end of that phase that you were able to, to embark on a new beginning in life. I would argue that the biggest mistakes in life happen when we rush from one to three. That when we rush too quickly from an ending to a beginning, that, that middle phase, that liminal space is hard, it's painful, it's difficult, but yet it is absolutely crucial. And adolescence is that liminal zone between childhood and adolescence where we learn to live with ambiguity. I have come to realize that we as Americans suffer from something that someone once referred to, and I love this phrase, microwave maturity. Isn't that great? Microwave maturity. We want to grow up as quickly as possible. We want to be as mature. We want everything now, and we want it faster and faster and faster. And as a result of that, we don't have time to sit still because there's so much to do, so much to see, so much to experience, and we rush through it. And in our hurry, we fail to learn the lessons that are important for us to live. We simply fail to be alive in that moment. Oftentimes, there's a great deal of ambiguity over knowing what comes next. And that's why it's important for us as a church to offer places where it's okay not to have all the answers, to model for our young people what it's like to live with those questions, to live in that ambiguity. Now, you've heard me say before that there's essentially two types of churches. There are answer churches and there are journey churches. I'm not the first one to say that. Scott Colglazier was the first to give language to it. Answer churches and journey churches and we unapologetically are a journey church. And we try with all that we can to live out the questions rather than find quickly the answers. When I was doing youth ministry, I learned that one of the most important things that I could say when a young people would come to me with a question, with a struggle, is to say simply, I don't know. I don't know. Because what that would do would free them to develop their own answers, to develop their own sense of faith. If I, they came and asked for questions and issues of faith and I gave them mine, they wouldn't be wearing their own faith. They wouldn't have their own faith. They would have my faith and faith is personal. I don't know, I would say, but I will not leave you in the midst of your journey. But we'll walk with you through all of us. Adolescence, much like life, is learning to live with ambiguity, to be comfortable with the uncertainty. The second one is perspective. Now, I'm at the age of my life where I come to realize that, that, that life is so much better, life is so much richer when you live with a level of perspective. And when it comes to adolescence, I think that there's perspective not just for our young people, but also for their parents. And I speak as one of them. I was reminded this last week of Khalil Gibran's poem that is found in the book, The Prophet. Listen to this perspective for parents. Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, he says, but seek not to make them like you. A great perspective for parents, but also the perspective for young people is the importance of realizing that your life is not your own that you are a part of something bigger than yourselves, that, that, that life is a team sport. That's the responsibility piece that we talked about last week. That we all have a role to play. Your life is not your own. Next week, when we talk about adulthood, we'll talk about the, the difference in perspective between happiness and success. That's what they call a teaser. The third smooth stone 
to help us navigate through the valley of transition is accountability. It's when we come to appreciate and to understand, the, the, to accept responsibility for our own life. And I would argue that, like other things, this is learned in adolescence or it's not learned at all. Now, I don't know about you, but I get so frustrated and I get so tired of people who constantly blame anybody and everybody else that nothing is ever their fault. Does anybody know somebody like that? This is not a good time to elbow your spouse, by the way. I get so frustrated of people for whom nothing is ever their fault. And I think in many ways that's in part because of the litigious culture, right? We, we live in a culture, you've probably heard the story, where somebody sued McDonald's because their coffee was too hot. Newsflash, coffee is hot. <laughs> and if you're not careful, you will burn. Not everything is always someone else's fault. Well, here's where the church comes in. It's about the importance of allowing our young people to listen to the right messages. Have you seen, have you noticed some of the ads that are directed at our young people? The message that our young people hear again and again and again, a thousand different ways and a thousand different times every single day, is that you are nothing unless you are a size three. That you look like the women in the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. That you're nothing as a young man unless you have rock-hard abs and bulging biceps. But young people come to church and we share with them this important message that you are not your body. That you are far more than that. You are a child of God. That you are created in the image of God and you are loved as you are. Whether you're a size 3 or 33, you are loved as you are, and I realize how hard that message is, how easily it constantly gets drowned out in our culture, but part of being an adolescent is learning to listen to the right messages and about being accountable to the right people. The fourth smooth stone that helped us navigate through the valley of transition is risk is risk. Part of being an adolescent is learning to take risks. In many ways, that's the reason, I would argue, that, that many of our young people experiment and, and try new things. They drive too fast. They, they tried alcohol or drugs or sex. But I would argue that perhaps the church exists in part to challenge our young people to risk in other areas. You heard how our young people, our high school group, just returned this week, returned from serving this week, and in Albuquerque, and in that week they risked serving the world. They placed their energy in helping those that are less fortunate. And so we come to church and, and we tell our young people to stand up and to speak out for those on the underside of power, those on the fringes, those that don't sit at the cool kids' table in the cafeteria. If you want to risk, risk loving them. Stand up. Speak out for them. Here's what I've come to discover. What I've learned the hard way in my own life is that the greatest risk that you will ever face in life is to not be the person that God created you to be. The greatest risk that any of us will ever face in our life is to not be the person that God created us to be. And that's true whether we are 14 or 44 or 104. We must always be the people that God created us to be. And then finally, the fifth smooth stone is to recognize that God all too often comes in disguise. You know, when we face giants, when we face danger in this chapter in our lives, it's best to hold on to that promise that, that God will be with us no matter what we face, whatever struggles we encounter. Do you remember a few months ago when we were looking at the book of Daniel, we talked about the, the story of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, those three young men, those adolescents at that time, that were told in that moment that they must worship, they must bow down to Pharaoh, and they said, sorry, we don't dance that dance. We worship 
the God of Israel, and that God alone. And they said, if you don't do that, we will throw you in the fiery furnace, which is a metaphor for hell. And they said, sorry, we will not. And so they threw them into the fire because they wouldn't change their beliefs. You know, sometimes in the valley of transition, it feels not just for our young people, but also their parents, it feels like we have been thrown into the fire. That sometimes it can feel hellish. But it's important to remember that that was not the end of that story. That the very jailers themselves, the ones that threw them into the fire, at one point checked. They opened the door and says, wait a minute. Didn't we throw three into the fire? Then why is there four? And the fourth one appears to be the Son of God. You see, the message that we learn in that moment is that we are never alone. And I get it. We all want a different God. We want to, a God that's going to rearrange things, that's going to protect us from bad things ever happening. We're never going to get our heart broken. We're never going to lose someone we love. No one's ever going to let us down. But that's not the way that it works in life. But in the midst of those battles, when we stand up, when we confront those giants, what we come to discover is that God is with us in the midst of those hellish moments, that we are never alone. And there comes a time, doesn't there? There comes a time when we realize that, when we realize that we're never alone, when we come to the realization that that's what we would have asked for in the first place if we knew that's what we really wanted, what we really needed was the presence of God in the most hellish of moments. Never, never are we alone. God comes to us all too often in disguise. But the promise of Scripture is that we are never alone.